Am I coming? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is, oh, hold on. We got to refocus. We can hear you. OK, thanks. I had to replug my mic. I uh, apologize for that being such a mess. Um, I didn't, I had, it went a lot better than it did in data structures, I'll tell you that. Um, the problem is when I reconnect stuff, the USB inputs, it's, it's a little complicated. So, um, Twister, that was, a, that, was, um, that was baby Philip Seymour Hoffman, if, if anyone's a Philip Seymour Hoffman fan, so, so young. Uh, and, uh, of course, Helen Hunt. So, uh, what I want to do is think about uh, what kinds of data we're interested in and come up with a taxonomy for figuring out uh, how we can describe the various pieces of data that, that we have. Um, and I want to differentiate between, well, is this, is this just a stats course uh, or, or what is this? And I like the Twister example because it emphasizes the idea that a statistician is in general going to expect the data to be assembled in a data set and they're going to approach the data cycle um, once everything is nice and clean um, but rather as a data analyst a data scientist in this program what we want to uh, facilitate you learning how to do is everything from designing the uh, overall data project so asking the question uh, figuring out what the right question to ask is, coming up with that inquiry question, building the tool, so in our case, uh, from the film, building Dorothy, uh, configuring the sensors, uh, actually gathering the data from the field and getting it back in all of its messiness. And from there, figuring out how to clean uh, and arrange the data that we got from the field. All of this happens before we ever crunch anything, before we run any major uh, analytic tools through the data, is we have these, um, these larger sequences of a data project that a strict statistician uh, is not going to be as concerned with. So once we clean and arrange, that's when we can start the analytic process of trying to extract from the data patterns that we can uh, draw conclusions from. So an analysis and then sharing would be at the end. Um, 
So I like I like the Twister clip because you kind of get a sense that they have been building this data tool uh, all the way from the ground up, and the messiness of figuring out. Oh my goodness! Uh, if you watch the whole film, those those little sensors that it sucks up initially, um, they they um, they didn't have any way to get grabbed by the air in the tornado, so they had to build little um, little fans to get them sucked up. So that's the messiness of building a tool and gathering data and realizing that maybe the data that we're gathering is 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 uh, is not precise enough or it's not accurate enough, and having to cycle through this process uh, somewhat. So I shouldn't put a cross through stats. If any statisticians are out there, they're probably going to get cross with me. So it's we'd say it's it's stats and then everything that that came before uh, the actual statistics. Um, so in order to learn this process, I want to start by thinking about how we would describe the types of data that we could organize. So here's a tornado, like the one that we want to study. Um, and let's, uh, I'd encourage you to take some notes. Paper is good. Um, computer is good too. Um, when possible, I'll screen clip these notes and post them, but it's good for your brain to actually uh, have the experience of, of creating the taxonomy. So let's, um, let's think uh, about data as generally as possible and figure out which components we're interested in this course. So for, uh, in this case, we have two major uh, ways that we might gather data. The first would be from sensors like we saw in Twister. So sensor data, sensor data or um, versus gathering from, we would say like a human reporting would be two major branches of uh, they have their own set of constraints and problems for asking humans to report things uh, is interacting with uh, personality and language, whereas sensor data is dealing with electronics and voltage precision and signal analyzing. And so from the Twister standpoint, they were working uh, mostly with sensor data. Um, in, in our class, we don't have as much access to sensors, so we'll be doing uh, a chunk of uh, human reporting data, or human re uh, human reported data. Um, we attempted with our capstone class uh, during COVID term to uh, do a sensor data project with automotive technology, and that turned out to be uh, a bit of a mess. Um, but I would say, in general, uh, data about humans reported by humans uh, will probably be mostly the focus of, of this class. Um, so now let's think about a tornado and theorize just a little bit about uh, the types. And I'm going to pull up a graphic that we'll look at again next week. That breaks down uh, our types and then we'll figure out how those types are handled and uh, experience inside of a, a computer. Um, so I want to jump back to schedule uh, data structure stations. Um, so the key branches that we want to build out are qualitative and quantitative data and then how those types can break down further. So I realized that that chart was not as complete as I wanted. So I'm just going to rebuild it here. So from data sources, we could get uh, all of these types from either of our data sources. Um, and so let's say uh, data uh, from all sources. Our major groupings then are going to be uh, qualitative data and quantitative 
Um, so what would be an example of, let me scoot my whole camera over a bit. Oh no, straight wire. So when we think uh, quantitative, we're thinking uh, numeric, but we want to expand that uh, to make it a little bit more precise. Qualitative data our big element here is uh, is text uh, and speech. And what would be another component of qualitative data that's not immediately numeric in the way that uh, we approach it? Uh, we could say um, photos, um, so image data, text and speech are two major categories. And one of our challenges with computers is that they are fundamentally quantitative tools. And so a lot of what we sometimes work with in data analytics is trying to figure out how do we take qualitative data and figure out how to turn it into quantitative numeric types that can then be uh, crunched and processed using various tools. So what are um, some categories of quantitative data? For those of you that have done programming stuff, what, uh, what are some key data types that you interact with uh, uh, from a computer standpoint. Integers. Integers. Yep, so we have a, a range of types of numbers. So we have uh, integer data. So uh, this is important. And integers contrast with what type? Whole numbers. Uh, we put whole numbers as a subset of integers and thinking what would be the contrast to an integer? Digital data. Uh, these would all, that's a good guess, digital data. I'm thinking floating Strings? points. Oh, yeah, uh, data that yeah. has uh, decimal places. So uh, 3.876. Um, what, the key divisions here are important because your processor on your computer actually has, I've got a little processor here, what we're, what we're working with, Let's see if I can flip over to that. Um, so here's an example of, uh, this is a Pentium 2. So what we're looking at is actually the underside of a, a computer processor that would sit on uh, a motherboard. So here's your, this is the tool we're trying to figure out. So a processor would sit, this is a big heat sink, a big aluminum fan that keeps uh, the processor as cool as possible. And so this would sit on the motherboard and inside the processor are what, what component, what's the, What's the key component that makes processors tick? What's it called? A clock. <laughs> uh, certainly we have a clock that keeps, keeps the cycle going. And who's responding to the clock? The CPU. CPU. Yes, and what's the t component inside the CPU that makes all the magic happen? It starts with a T. The transistor. The transistor, exactly. Um, so there's about, uh, well now I guess we're, uh, Apple no longer discloses the processor that it puts in its phones, but uh, many mobile computing devices today have upwards of one billion uh, transistors organized in, uh, in layers inside of the processor. And those transistors create the logic for uh, implementing operations, and processors have separate CPU areas for processing integers versus floating point. So as we start our data journey, um, tools will run at different speeds depending on which type of data is going into it because the logic 
the logic tools inside the processor are actually separate for working with uh, data that's represented as uh, fractions of, uh, of larger amounts versus an integer can be represented in straight binary in, in much more routine ways. Um, so integers, floating point, and then our simplest quantitative numeric type would be just uh, Boolean, which would be our true false type. And so within this breakdown, let's try to now map out some, uh, some ways that we uh, cross between the qualitative and the quantitative land, because that's ultimately part of the data project design is figuring out what exact variables are we going to record about this tornado. You know, if we think about what are, if the subject, um, if our subject is a tornado, we can think about a given tornado, we could measure a variety of variables. My handwriting is terrible. Would dates factor into any of this at all? Ooh, good. I forgot dates. Um, where do you think that would fall under qualitative or quantitative? Probably quantitative. I'm gonna guess. Uh, yes, absolutely. Same. Um, Things like dates on most computers are expressed as a ticking clock that counts how many seconds have elapsed since midnight UTC on January 1st, 1970. Wow, it's like, <laughs> I hear myself just, that's that's the exact phrase that I use. It's the millisecond since January 1st, 1970. Was that Matthew? Yes. Oh. I go by Ryan on the internet, but yes, it was Matthew. That's right, okay. Um, so that's what makes a date strictly in the quantitative form is that to a computer, uh, it's just an, it's actually an integer number. So uh, dates, uh, date values are a, uh, we would, actually let's put them as a subset of integer because we would say that it's a way of interpreting an integer value as a, uh, in, in just a form a, that makes sense to humans. Is, isn't it just a scalar, scalar value? Yep, it would just, a date would just be a single integer scalar value, absolutely. Um, and then a library that runs on your operating system will have to figure out how to convert that date scalar value into something that's more human friendly. So date value and that's as um, originally as an integer of milliseconds, milli cents, epic, the beginning of computer time. Um, the date value is certainly going there. So um, text and speech, uh, because computers are so focused on giving us quantitative outputs and processing quantitative data, uh, a key way that we see the crossover here is by designing uh, categorical data. Um, so this would be the select which item from the list best represents you and those items can be described in text, but we associate those with integer values, which we can then do numeric processing on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a, um, let's make a, a bridge between these two um, to actually put categorical data as, it's kind of, it's a crossover type, if you will. And this will lead into our strip survey, which will take up next. 2006. Okay, so categorical data. So um, this might be uh, that coming through. Okay, yeah. So we could say um, one if we were just doing a a survey of, uh, about student involvement in this class. You might say, which best describes you? Are you a uh, certificate student or a uh, associate's degree or undeclared. And so we can associate a category with 
a quantitative value, but the distance, say, between one and two doesn't have um, doesn't have interpretable meaning in this categorical context. Rather, we're using the numbers as a uh, a symbol for an idea, uh, rather than um, a measurement that has a continuous value. And so that gives us in contrast to a true quantitative or numeric value that we might call a continuous variable. So uh, categorical is a crossover between these two and then within here where, where the best place to put this? Um, so within floating point, we have a subtype of a continuous variable. So the example there would be on tornadoes, uh, wind speed would be an example there to say we could make a scale of on a number line of wind speed uh, zero I think the um, uh, the official tornado scale is I think based on max wind speed so if we have a number line um, if we're measuring a floating point quantitative value of wind speed where 10, 20, 30, these have a numeric relationship and that the distance they are between each other on a number line relates to the actual concept that we're measuring, like wind speed, whereas it doesn't make sense on a categorical data to say that, oh, associate is number two, it's, it's twice the certificate. That, that doesn't have conceptual meaning, but if we're measuring wind speed in miles per hour, it absolutely does make sense to say a wind speed of 20 has a relationship of uh, twice the speed as a measurement of 10. So uh, continuous quantitative floating point values um, are often the kind of data that we get from sensors uh, because they can provide us uh, measurements along a range of, of values. Categorical data is the kind of thing that we, uh, we create symbolically with human language and then associated with numbers for ease of processing. Uh, good job on the dates. We've got dates, booleans, integers, floating points. Um, so as a data scientist, we, any given computer platform might store and represent data of different types with different types of memory configurations and different support um, for conversions between those different types. Like, for example, the uh, built-in uh, database in Python called SQLite uh, does not actually have a particular date type. It just has integers and it has utilities for passing in integers and saying, I'm giving you an integer converted to a, a date, um, or I'm giving you a date, spit out the integer so I can store it in there. So this is the most general uh, frame of reference. And then within each language, uh, R, Python, uh, like I said, in SQLite, the way that those are actually stored down in the computer can vary significantly. Um, so I'll just give you a quick example of that. Uh, and so what do we mean by how it could vary? So if you're jumping into Python, um, we could go to python.org and look for its basic data types. And many, um, uh, oh, we do not want that. Sorry. Uh, I did it Unfortunately, Python.org's um, does not have a very good search function. So you can see in any given language, 
Python has a lot more types than we listed because they have variations on um, where is our date time? List frozen set bytes. Um, I'm sorry, I should have looked this up before. Um, here's our database that we'll use in um, in our database class. I just wanted you to be able to see um, in any given platform. So here's our our database tool that we use. You can see there are individual ways that it can represent different data types like we put in our in our charts so some storing very large integers some platforms will actually give you uh, significantly more space a uh, whole eight bytes um, versus just storing a smaller integer gives you four bytes uh, and so let's review what we mean by that uh, in our computer systems, computers only know uh, the logic and the binary systems within them deal in uh, on-off values, which we symbolically represent uh, with zeros and ones. And we'll dig into this in a little bit more uh, focus next week, but I just want to give you a bit of a preview. So we symbolically represent uh, on-offs with ones and zeros, but ultimately, what are we actually talking about on the hardware level is voltage or no voltage. And so we could say zero and one are just handy human symbols for conveying a, you can imagine a, a pipe and instead of electricity, if you imagine, we're saying, is there fluid or no fluid? So if we chop the pipe up into little segments and a on bit or a one, we could think of as there is fluid or there is voltage and a zero is there is no voltage. And who said clock when I asked about the basic tool? Who was our clock person? Me. Who was me? Ryan. Ryan. Oh, yeah. So Ryan said a uh, clock is an important <laughs> part of a computer, and the clock is what uh, moves our sequence of ones and zeros along for processing. Um, but all computers at their base level only know how to interact with sequences of ones and zeros. And so if we have eight of those together, we call eight ones and zeros uh, one byte and would be considered the absolute uh, base level container or representation of data inside a computer. Uh, so when we are exploring data science, individual languages and programs uh, use different amounts of storage to store data of these different types. Um, and so as you pursue various uh, programming languages, it's a good idea to get familiar with um, you know, what are their different types of integers? How long do they, uh, how much space do they take up? Meaning how, how big of a value can they store? Um, and so we'll build this out a little bit more next week when we think about how do we organize integers together? How would we organize floating point data in more complicated structures? Um, questions or comments on our, on our tree, our basic data overview tree? Okay, um, <clears throat> so the final thing I want to do this evening is uh, preview our exercise that I'm going to push mostly to next week, which is dealing in um, thinking about our relationship of gathering some categorical data, and <clears throat> uh, I'm going to have to do some thinking about the, the floating point. 
Um, so if you'll join me, this is called the strip survey exercise. If you join me back on our home page, um, I decided to not do the stations because the Zoom was just too too many uh, challenges with that. Um, so I want to introduce you to our upload drive. And so within our data analytics main index, um, the DAT project upload shared drive is the, the house for where we store a lot of our work. And so if you'll join me there, Uh, in general, when we submit work, we'll put it into uh, an appropriate directory. Now, these are this uh, Google Cloud. This isn't sorry. This is Microsoft OneDrive. OneDrive is set up to allow uh, public upload, but you can't delete other people's files. And so, this is uh, me trying to not make you have to log in every time you want to look at something and, and upload a file. Um, so one thing that it means is if you accidentally upload the wrong file, uh, you can't delete it. You should send me a, an email and say, I accidentally uploaded the wrong file. Um, the easiest thing to do is just re-upload it, um, and I'll see that you have a duplicate, and I'll delete the oldest one. Um, what I want to do is, is scroll down to strip surveys, and um, I want to show you how these will work for next week so you can start brainstorming. Um, I was trying to get you the link to this, but Microsoft's tool is so bad that I can't even log into my back end here without a, a bunch of work. So we're under strip surveys. And then let's take a look at the uh, spring 20 uh, strip surveys. And so what's our goal here? Our goal here is to gather data about everyone in the class of two different types, of a categorical type and a continuous quantitative type, and to explore how we can use basic spreadsheet tools and box and whisker plots to describe that data. And in order to do that, I want you to choose a, uh, a topic of interest to you and design a two-question survey that, uh, that we'll administer to the class. And I'm going to work on the logistics of that over the week. And so the, uh, let's take a look at Carl's. Um, and this will give you the general uh, overview. Uh, OneDrive is so unfortunate. And so the way that I describe these two questions is a slicer and a spectrum question, because I want us to get familiar working with variables of different types, and we can see how they get processed differently. So the idea is that we use a categorical question in which we ask the respondent to associate themselves with a one of a set of fixed categories. So that's our categorical crossover. We'll give those categories a number, but ultimately we're grouping them in a category. And then we ask them a question that's not categorical, but rather is a continuous spectrum of uh, between two different poles uh, that somehow are related. So Carl asks, do you have a family member who has suffered through a major illness or is currently suffering with a chronic illness? Yes or no? And then he asked, when you eat, what usually influences what you eat, nutritional value or convenience? And so you can see that uh, his logic in there is this idea of, could we tease out a relationship between uh, the respondent's experience with chronic illness and their approach to deciding what to eat. So we want to pair these questions together in a clever or interesting way because you're going to get to analyze uh, your data that you get from each other and then you'll also get to audit uh, one of your peers' data uh, for the sake of, of um, 
data integrity. So let's just look at a couple more and then I will uh, leave you to doing some of your, your own designing and thinking about this. Um, let's take a look at pennies. I think pennies was in good shape. Um, here's the strip survey. So you can uh, poke through these on your, at your leisure. So this was, uh, this is an example of a, um, probably a, a more, a more difficult spect or a less applicable spectrum question. So Penny works as a hairdresser. Do you get your hair cut at the same salon or barbershop the majority of the time? So slice the group into the yeses and the noes, and then ask them a question related to uh, this, in this case, it's the frequency, which is perhaps less of a, a applicable spectrum question um, because it's it, it's actually more of a single scalar value that um, is is countable, so less of a, a continuous spectrum. Um, this is a good one from Chris. Uh, did you plan on? Uh, some form of further education immediately after high school, yes or no? And then the spectrum was, if you were in charge of hiring employees, would you put more emphasis on an applicant's level of experience or education? So you can see there's a, uh, you can imagine Chris having a working theory about folks that jump perhaps right into post-secondary after high school might be more inclined to weight education over experience in hiring. Um, so I want you to start teasing out uh, an interesting uh, dynamic that you can investigate among members of the class. And since we've got 30 folks, um, that's cool. We'll get a nice, a nice chunk of data. Let me show you where this goes. Um, I pulled up um, a, a nice analysis of Rachel. So Rachel asked last term, um, have you or an immediate family member ever held a food service job where tips comprised part of the wages? Yes or no? And then this was, this was kind of a cool uh, idea. Typically, when you receive bad service at a restaurant, for example, servers are rude, slow moving, or got your order wrong, how much do you tip? Um, and so we're going to gather the data, and then we'll use uh, both the tools on um, uh, the lock five stats and spreadsheets to do some crunching of that data where we will learn about um, IDing individual responses, we'll touch on some basic spreadsheet skills, um, and then we will learn about our quartile ranges by slicing the data, slicing all the yeses and computing some summary statistics related to each of our sliced groups. Um, so this is where the project uh, goes for next week. Um, what else did she have there? Um, I think that's a pretty good uh, overview. Any other ones that I remember? Connie. Okay, so let me stop share there. Um, and ask if folks have uh, questions. So what I'm, what I'll ask you to do because I have to design. I want to try to build a way for us to answer spectrum questions um, on on the computer. Um, I shouldn't have stopped screen share so soon. Um, so where do you put your survey? You're going to put your survey in the uh, fall twenty directory. So what I would suggest is making yourself a folder where you can put your survey itself and your analysis. So um, Loretta made, so you can make a folder with new folder and then using just a word processor, I want you to design your simple strip survey for next week and drop it in your folder. And then by next week, I'll have figured out how we want to administer the surveys um, to the whole class. So um, 
questions? So your strip survey once again. The slicer is categorical. And then your spectrum should be some question about which people might have a, a broad range of ideas. And what I want you to do is come up with the, uh, you want to come up with markers for the end of your spectrum that show the, the poles of opinions about your particular spectrum question. So spectrum question, you can think of this as kind of the opinion question. And this is categorical or uh, a, a grouping question. You could think about it like grouping. Um, and the grouping we want to think about might the groups have distinctly patterned ways of responding to your spectrum question. Like if folks have family members that work in food service, they might be more inclined to tip at a higher percentage even if they had quote unquote bad service. So uh, what we'll do next week is we'll review these and we'll actually come up with a, a hypothesis of how these groups work out. Then we'll administer the survey and, and start doing some crunching. So any ideas coming to mind so far? Um, this is Steve. Yeah, I, have, have, yeah, I, I just, I just, I just had a question. Uh, maybe uh, for the class would be to um, create a, uh, a question on uh, the value on, on the experience versus take take a survey of, among the class on back people's backgrounds. How much people's uh, their, their education versus experience and where they're going in with their uh, with their uh, with their career. Now, how much how how do how do people within the class um, look at you know hey, hey he's got somebody's got three degrees but he's just out of school something like that maybe putting that I and I did have a question yes what um you know when when you call them spectrums mm -hmm. and I remember the term slicers from uh, I took a course in Excel mm -hmm. um, last year but in, in, in a spectrum isn't it um, sometimes people uh, spectrum questions take on scale or verb values like one one to ten or something like how much are you satisfied which uh, what's really the difference between a spectrum even though it's not a, a true value, it's a relative value versus a, a numeric binary. It's only a, you're trying to, in a way you're, you're you, there's a way with a lot of spectrum questions of uh, trying to s assign a scalar value to what is an opinion. Absolutely. Um, and uh, let me, did I, cut, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, I, I just, I, I guess my question is, what would be a, an example of a spectrum question that might not be able to have a scalar value, or, or is that just might not just the, the, just the fact that it's it's got a beginning and end point? Um, it doesn't. I don't know what you call it. Just an unknown. It's a relative value versus true scalar, like a math. Yeah, I, I think what you're what you're speaking to is. Um, is a is a statistical reality of when making estimates about a uh, when, when you're doing sampling it turns out that getting a continuous measurement about an entity allows you to make a stronger statistical inference but it's also harder to to get those values from the user so often surveys have taken what is a true spectrum, meaning there's an infinite number of points along a spectrum that someone's opinion could be, but 
it's too difficult from a tool standpoint to actually uh, represent very much precision. So we end up usually chopping our spectrums into a uh, an integer scale of zero through uh, through whatever. Um, what we will what we're going to endeavor to try to do is I'm going to try to build a tool that allows you to click along uh, the line and get a um, as close to a continuous value as we possibly can get. Um, so the answer is we usually chop up spectrums for the convenience of building surveys with little little buttons that people can touch or um, the using integers to represent parts of the spectrum so you can just enter a number on a keyboard. Um, yeah. So um, to your point about uh, education, so what I wanted to try to do is take that idea of um, of education and value and think about what are two or more distinct groups that you could put people in like do you have a bachelor's degree yes or no or your categorical question could be what's your what's the highest level of degree that you've earned or how many years of school um have you attained post, post secondary school? Scan. yep and then your spectrum question could be again this is going to be something more of an opinion in which we're going to see a higher degree of variation like um uh how might that affect people's opinions about um, maybe the, the concern over, over college costs. To what degree uh, do you feel that current college costs are prohibitive for people achieving their educational goals? Um, completely prohibitive, not prohibitive at all. So that's the kind of thing where people might have an opinion that falls somewhere in between there. Yeah, another, another way of, Putting that would be talking about education would be um, academic versus vocational the types yeah. of the type the types of uh, training that people have. Not just you know, in our especially in the United States, we tend to assign too much maybe to uh, vocation uh, educational training, academic training versus vocational, whereas really. Um, Vocational training to me, in a lot, a lot of ways, more applicable as you yeah. get practical experience in, in a vocational. You, you get a balance of, of both academic and and, uh, and uh, experiential training. You know, it's actually a better form of of, of a, a training depending on what field it is. But even something like this, yeah. you know, like like. Because I went to Drexel University, and they have a co-op program, so you get a smattering of both, you know. Uh, anyway. Yeah, fair. That that that's. I'm. Just, I think you'll be able to come up with some interesting stuff there. Um, as a community college teacher, I go vocations. Um, yeah, I, I I I. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the idea I have for my survey thing would be like. Do you play video games, console or medium notwithstanding? Mm -hmm. Yes or no, do you play games? And what are your opinions about violent video games? That's what I was going on, with. On the, on the extreme end of the spectrum, if the game even thinks about mentioning a gun, it is awful and should be banned entirely. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, if I can't get, a, if I can't get at least 100 kills in a single game, it's not <laughs> worth my money. That's right, they have the kill counts out of those things. Uh, I'm yeah. trying to control about my opinion on that. Um, so any violence in game, um, uh, ban it. So you can think of what might be some clever extremes to label your your spectrum. Um, we want the slicer question to be uh, as neutral as possible, um, so that we're not preconditioning folks. For, we're not uh, contaminating our uh, respondent by suggesting what we think the theory actually is. Um, so the more objective you can be about uh, the slicer, the better. Um, let's take a look at a couple others just for uh, stirring our stirring the pot. Um, so this didn't get formatted very well, but have you had a family member take leave under the Federal Family Medical Leave Act? Yes or no? So there's your category. And then we're interested in how 
public funding, how perspective on public funding might vary between these two groups. Um, and so I would space this out uh, if you were building the tool. When we were in person, pre-COVID, we printed these all out and we had a really neat little uh, round robin where we all stood up and took everyone's survey in 15 second chunks and it's kind of fun. Um, I'm gonna reinvent how to do that for, um, for online. So the formatting of your question is much less important, uh, but the thinking around what are you curious about and uh, how can you embody the idea of a some sort of continuous spectrum versus a category because then that will give us our raw material for doing spreadsheets and, and stuff like that. Um, Incredibly just, stupid idea about reinventing the round robin method. Have uh -huh. like a 15 second Kahoot quiz or something. Does, do those, does a Kahoot quiz have the ability to, to touch along a line? Do you know? Uh, know I, I don't think so. It's, it's, if I remember, if it's the same as it was two years ago when I last did my Kahoot quizzes, I, I think it would probably still only be limited to four multiple choices, which is okay, kind of anyone, unfortunate. If anyone has ever taken an online tool that has you click along a line uh, and gives you a continuous value instead of uh, individual numbers or, or that, it let, you know, let me know because I'm going to going to tackle some JavaScript, I hope, over the week and see if I can cook it up myself. Um, other questions? Yeah, I have a question about the spectrum scale. Yep. So like when it when the spectrum question is not something that has a very clear number attached to it, like a question of how many times a week do you work out? Mm -hmm. If it's something like what's up here where like I don't think games are violent at all or I don't think uh, violent games are bad versus no one should ever be able to touch weapons in a game. Are we kind of identifying some landmarks in here and we're assigning a numeric value to it? So zero could represent, uh, what do you mean? Games have never been violent in the history of the world. And like five could be, why did we ever invent video games? They're terrible. Yeah, so what we will do uh, when we were in person, we actually got rulers and we measured from zero to where the person put the X, uh, and then based on your, uh, your polls, then in your interpretation, you did exactly what you said of, of uh, zero. The, the extreme value of zero represents this idea, um, and then people's measured value suggests some, some ratio of how close they were to that extreme value. Um, for things like the workout amount, um, you, I would encourage you to make the, like, a that kind of factual, how many times a week do you work out? That seems more like a slicer. So you could make categories of ranges that you think, uh, have some, uh, meaning within the exercise world of, you know, it is you know, one to two times a week is that kind of a, a group of people that might have a, a reason to have a similar opinion about a spectrum question. So if it's like number of times you do something or how many of something you have, I would encourage you to uh, build appropriate categories um, of those ranges. So maybe it's one to two X, uh, three to five, uh, six to 18. <laughs> I don't know how many times people exercise, uh, 36 times a week. Um, so you could then have categories like that, um, which we could label with letters if we want. Did you have an idea of a spectrum question related to exercise? No, not, I don't even know if it's going to be about that. I just threw it out there as an idea of a spectrum of a potential spectrum that has numbers already attached to it more okay. to just get at the actual question of assigning numerical values to different milestones if you will on like a opinionated spectrum question so I'd, yeah i'd put those in the slicer okay this by Thanks. the way is loretta so loretta participates in class whenever she can 10 out of 10 good cat ah yes um other, I, uh, other ideas? 
No, I had a question. After the last girl.